Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Julie Oliver. And she's not a scientist, but she is interested in science. Today we are going to be looking at basic science mistake being made by proponents of ivermectin. For those of you who don't know, ivermectin is a medication that is used to treat worms and other parasites in both humans and animals. But it has developed almost a cult following, with some people claiming it is a treatment for COVID. So let's go back to the science and compare their claims with the facts. So the first basic science mistake, which I see all the time in the comment sections on YouTube videos, is assuming new antivirals, in particular the new antivirals developed by Merck and Pfizer, are just tweaked versions of ivermectin. Now, finding ways to improve drugs at work is a legitimate area of research, but it makes no sense to do this for ivermectin because at the moment it hasn't been proven to work. It would be like putting lipstick on a pig. And as it happens, this mistake is very easy to disprove. This picture shows the structure of ivermectin, the structure of molnupiravir, which is Merck's new drug, and the structure of Pfizer's new antiviral, which doesn't have a name yet. You don't need to be a chemist to see that they bear no resemblance to each other. They have as much in common as a frog, a parrot, and an elephant. The next science mistake being made by ivermectin fans is failing to understand the limitations of in vitro research. In vitro research is essentially testing that is done on cells in laboratories. And it's an important first step for screening any potential treatments. And it's the type of research that I do. Alas though, less than one in a thousand potential medications that work in vitro end up being successful in clinical trials. And in the case of ivermectin, there was even less reason to think the initial in vitro research would translate to clinical efficacy. The first reason is that concentrations achieved in the blood after taking ivermectin are a hundredfold less than needed to kill SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. Now, lung co concentrations are slightly higher than blood concentrations, but they are still 50-fold less than what is needed to inhibit the virus in vitro. So basically, the concentrations necessary to inhibit the virus aren't achievable at a safe dose. But that's only half the problem. The initial in vitro study was done in vero cells, which are monkey kidney cells. Now, I'm sure you all know SARS-CoV-2 doesn't typically infect kidney cells. It infects lung or airway cells, and we're not monkeys. Does this really matter? Well, yes. Viruses can only replicate by entering and then taking over the machinery of cells. And how they do this won't necessarily be the same for all cells. As it happens, in July 2020, this very point was proven for two other medications that had quite a cult following, namely chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So here's the paper, and it was published in Nature, which is one of the highest impact journals around. I would love to have a paper in Nature. So what this paper found was that although chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine were able to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 in monkey kidney cells, they didn't inhibit it in human lung cells. And the reason for this was that SARS-CoV-2 is only able to enter monkey kidney cells through one route, and this route is blocked by hydroxychloroquine. However, SARS-CoV-2 can also enter lung cells via a different route, and hydroxychloroquine has no effect on that route. Of course, there have now been a number of large-scale randomised trials that have confirmed that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work for COVID. What about ivermectin? Does that work in lung cells? Well, for quite a while we didn't know, but now a study has been done. Here's the study. Well, the title's a bit of a giveaway, but in case you missed it, no, ivermectin doesn't stop SARS-CoV-2 replication in lung cells. Now, it's worth mentioning that this paper is still a preprint, which means it hasn't yet been through the peer review process. So the final version may be different. But given the majority of so-called studies on ivermectin are also not peer reviewed, I think it's worth looking at this paper. What they firstly did was verify that ivermectin was able to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 in monkey kidney cells. And the concentration necessary was similar to that found in the original study. And that's good. They then repeated the experiments in both lab-grown lung cells 
and cells taken directly from the lungs of patients. And what they found was that ivermectin had no effect whatsoever, even if its concentration was doubled. They also tried treating SARS-CoV-2 outside of cells and again, found it had no effect. So what this means is that there is absolutely no in vitro evidence that ivermectin works for COVID. Now, it is possible that it could work by some other mechanism that is not directly related to its action on the virus or on lung cells, but this would need to be proven in clinical trials. And that brings me to the next size mistake made by ivermectin fans, assuming all clinical trials are equal. The only type of clinical trial that is able to determine if a treatment is effective or not is what is known as a randomised controlled trial. What happens in a randomised controlled trial is people are randomly assigned to one of two groups. And this randomization step is critical because without it, you don't know whether your two groups have differences that will affect their outcome. One group is given the treatment and the other group is given a tablet that looks identical to the treatment, but doesn't actually contain any medication, otherwise known as a placebo. You then compare the results of the two groups and see if there is any difference. Now, most ivermectin fans ignore this and get their data from various websites that combine all trials, regardless of whether they are properly designed or not. These websites falsely claim that they have done meta-analyses when in fact they have missed the most crucial step in performing a meta-analysis, which is to determine what trials are actually designed to answer the question. And if you do this, it is a classic case of garbage in, garbage out. Luckily, there are more reputable sources of information on ivermectin. The most thorough review of meta-analysis has been done by the Cochrane Library. And Cochrane is the gold standard for doing these types of reviews. The complete report is 156 pages long, so we won't go over all of it now. But if you have the time, it is well worth a read because they explain in detail the shortcomings of a lot of the current trials that have been completed. But for now, we'll just have a look at the author's conclusions. Based on the current very low to low certainty evidence, we are uncertain about the efficacy and safety of ivermectin used to treat or prevent COVID-19. The completed studies are small and few are considered high quality. Several studies are underway that may produce clearer answers in review updates. Overall, the reliable evidence available does not support the use of ivermectin for treatment or prevention of COVID-19 outside of well-designed randomised trials. So basically, there is no evidence at the moment that ivermectin works, but trials are continuing. Now, since this review was published, two large trials have also reported results. One trial, Valajos et al, involved 501 patients, and the other trial, the TOGETHER trial, involved 1,355 patients. Neither trial showed any benefit for ivermectin. Now, I would like to cover one more so-called meta-analysis that is often touted by ivermectin fans as evidence of its efficacy, namely Bryant et al. This was a study completed by an ivermectin advocacy group called BIRD, whose members also spread false information about vaccines. They claimed to have followed the Cochrane protocol, but obviously they didn't because the Cochrane Review didn't find any evidence of efficacy, and they're claiming they did. As it happens, a recent paper in the British Medical Journal outlines issues with this so-called meta-analysis. The article was authored by the same people who did the Cochrane Review, and they explain why the meta-analysis done by the BIRD group is not valid. As I've previously mentioned, the first step in a meta-analysis should be to assess the trials before inclusion. The BIRD group meta-analysis claims to have done this, but 11 of the trials they have included do not meet what is known as grade criteria and should have been excluded if they were following Cochrane standards. As an example, they have included trials where ivermectin was combined with other treatments, but attributed the total effect to ivermectin. Furthermore, they have combined trials that shouldn't be combined in a meta-analysis. Or in the words of the authors, Brian et al. pulled heterogeneous patient population, interventions, comparators, and outcomes 
In other words, they compare apples and oranges serving a large bowl of a colorful fruit salad. Believe it or not, it gets worse. A group of scientists have been digging into the data on a number of the ivermectin studies. I'll provide links to all the analyses that they've done so you can look at it for yourselves, but I'll give you a quick summary. The scientists involved in the analyses were Jack Lawrence, Gideon Meyerwitz Katz, James Heathers, Nicholas Brown, and Kyle Sheldrick. And what they found was just stunning. A number of studies included in the Bryant et al. meta analysis have serious errors of, or signs of potential fraud. Some of the issues they found include the same patient data being used multiple times for supposedly different people, evidence that selection of patients for test groups was not random, and those chosen for placebo arms were predisposed to have worse outcomes. Numbers unlikely to occur naturally, which could mean someone made them up mistakes in calculations, and local health bodies being unaware of the studies, which suggests that the studies never actually happened as described. Unsurprisingly, if the studies where issues were found are removed from the Brian et al. meta-analysis, ivermectin no longer shows a benefit. There are still some ongoing randomised controlled trials of ivermectin, so it's possible those trials might show a benefit, but I wouldn't be holding my breath. Now, I was planning to cover some more science mistakes that ivermectin fans make, but this video is getting a bit long, so I'll make a part two video. If you want to see that video, just press the subscribe button. And if there is anything you would like me to cover, please mention it in the comments. If you would like to read the papers and articles that I discussed yourselves, you'll find links to them in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening.